Hey, John, can you hear me okay? Yes, I do, Dave. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, and, and thank you. I really appreciate you taking a moment to speak with me. been a fan for a very long time. Thank you. Appreciate that. You are welcome. The theme of the tour that you're doing, 1969, if you can just uh-huh. d- describe for folks, I know there are three critical records that came out in that year. If you can just take us through some of your thinking and how you're presenting the tour and what will be in store for the people coming to see you. Well, um, the inspiration for this, by the way, the, the initial idea came from my wife, uh, at least this time around, you know, over the years... <laughs> People, of course, have remarked on the fact that um, Credence put out three albums in that year, 1969, and I've talked, to, you know, talked with um, interviewers about it. And I, but that was, about, you know, it, it was a remarkable thing. But that's about as far as it went. And one day, my wife just sort of was. I think she'd been thinking about it for a while, but she said, "Why don't we just have a show?" where we actually present the idea of the year of 1969. And that was kind of a different way of looking at the same thing. And I thought, gee, that might be fun. So obviously uh, I play as much music from those three albums as uh, possible. You know, going back to the original, to that year, um, I was a highly motivated individual, let's say. (laughs) And after Suzy Q was a hit, um, you know, I, there has been a syndrome in rock and roll called the one-hit wonder. And I was uh, perfectly poised at the edge of that particular uh, cliff to become one of those. I said, oh, my goodness, I don't want that to happen. So I sort of took stock of uh, my situation. I was on a tiny label and... We didn't really have a manager or a publicist or any of the stuff that you usually have. And so I kind of said this phrase to myself, well, I guess I'm just going to have to do it with music, meaning I'm going to kind of take the bull by the horns and just create, you know, write as many good songs as I can and get them uh, rehearsed with my band and recorded and, and get the music out there. I really didn't realize that it was some sort of a, uh, Olympian feat to have three albums come out in a year. I was just sort of <laughs> thinking of self-preservation, to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, luckily and happily, the the very first single, Proud Mary, which came out, and the album Bayou Country, which came out on January 1st of 69, um, provided a very nice um, kind of introduction or launching pad for this a bunch of music that was about to come out of me. I, I just got really, really busy. And so that's sort of what we present in the show. You know, 1969, the late 60s, was a very culturally interesting and even volatile time in America and in the world. Um, of course, the people of my generation were just starting to come of age, the so-called boomers. And there was just a, you know, a lot of ideas floating around in the air. Of course, Various things happened. Um, Woodstock was a big event that year. We also, the the U.S. put a man on the moon. Um, And Credence had uh, eight hit songs on the radio, (laughs) if not more, that year. Would you have spaced them out? Looking back, if you could, would you have spaced those records out? Because as you noted, three in one year is just, it's a Hercule, you know, the feat of doing that. It it almost seems like you get more mileage. Would I have spread them out in hindsight? Yeah, in hindsight, if you could have dropped them in like 71, 72, and just kept them going like that. No, I I was totally going in in the face of the current wisdom. I mean, I know a few people... Even the you know the guy at the record company was saying, well, you should save those. You know, it was <laughs> right. born on the Bayou and Proud Mary were the first single, were the single. Um, and I just thought, you know, the people I really, really idolized that were at the very top of the mountain, meaning the Beatles and Elvis, had a whole bunch of double-sided hit singles, and uh, the very best ones could do that, and it meant that that a lot of their music was really great. And so I aspired to that. I, I just, the, the businessmen, you know, those sort of people, they, they wanted you to stretch it out. But I just, the, the thing in my head was, well, the fans will know. 
Yeah, that's and a good way of looking at it. probably what happened. That's a good way of looking at it. You me- you mentioned a couple inspirations there, John. Some other inspirations that have been close to you, Little Richard and Bo Diddley listed as, as critical folks. And aside from that 2008, I guess it was, Grammys jam with Little Richard, have you been able to interact with them meaningfully in your career? Uh, well, not Little Richard. I wish, I wish I could have. That was really the first time we had met. And, you know, I, and, and I finally got to tell him, you know, that I've loved him since I was a child. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm sure when you say that to somebody, it always makes them feel older or something. But, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I just, you know, I consider him probably the greatest rock and roll singer of all time. It just, you know, those early records are just phenomenal. Um, how can I say it? His, it, there, I didn't have um, access to him, or I wasn't on tour at the places where he was on tour, and so our, you know, our paths finally crossed, and I was sure glad to finally meet him. Bo Diddley never had that exchange with him. Oh yeah, we back, way back in the day with Credence, um, we got to do one whole season of touring with uh, Bo. Wow. Uh, he had had a kind of a resurgence in his career. He had a song called Baby I Love You. I think it was about 1968. It was a really cool song. I was, I know I wasn't um, having hit records yet, so it was just prior maybe to Suzy Q, or maybe right at the same time. And he had a, a lady in his act that he sang with on that song, I don't. And I think she played guitar, you know, with him, along with him, kind of like Mickey and Sylvia, that sort of thing. Um, and so we did a, a whole series of dates uh, that summer. I think that was probably '71, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Bo was a cool guy. That was <laughs> interesting. He had quite a mouth on him too, sometimes, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> from some times around him. Finally, John, uh, an area that um, I don't know how much you talk about this, but it was uh, it, it meant something to me as I'm sort of on, a, I guess, a spiritual path these days in my life uh, after losing my mom and my grandma. And something I saw, the 1990 special visit to Mississippi, Robert Johnson's grave. And I looked at that and wondered, is that a spiritual journey for you? And are there elements to that visit and your subsequent funding of headstones for other legends? that you'd just like to share, anything that came of that internally for you? That's a very interesting story. I, I had been getting sort of this call or this, this, this hearing this message in my head to, that I sh- should go to Mississippi. And it probably started somewhere around 1987, and it just had been there a while, but I, you know, it was like a, mm, a thought or a distraction. But it kept getting louder and louder and more insistent and finally sometime in a late 89 or early 90 i you know it just became uh overwhelming or compelling kind of like when richard dreyfus in um, close encounters is building that mashed potato mountain on his <laughs> dining room table right i mean finally I, I went to my she was my fiance then i told uh, julie i said I've got to, I don't know why, but I've got to go to Mississippi. She says, why? I said, I don't know. And so then she says, well, when are you going? I said, well, I've got to go now. <laughs> I ended up taking probably half a dozen trips. And basically, I, I, what I told myself, well, I'm, I'm filling in the blues family tree. I mean, all these artists I grew up with that were, you know, basically making hit records when I was a kid. And they were on the radio, like Jimmy Reed and... Of course, Elvis was from Mississippi, and Bo Diddley, and uh, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, you know, a lot of people that were having uh, vital hit careers then, several of whom had uh, passed on by 1990. And so I, I, you know, I got a lot of other people that I knew maybe less about, but it came to know better. Um, my, these trips consisted really of a lot of reading, a lot of listening to music, and then a lot of visiting grave sites, to tell you the truth, um, because many of the people were already passed on. And the the day that I, well, a few hours, really, just when I found uh, the legendary, actually, there were actually two or three purported burial sites of Robert Johnson, but 
the day I was there, um, I had this little, you, you probably already know the story, but I'll make it quick. <laughs> I had this vision, because right at that moment, Robert Johnson had a hit box set. You know, he was in the top ten, and, and so it was quite interesting. I, I was arguing in the heat of Mississippi, well, God, I wonder who owns those songs, and I had the picture that it was probably some, you know, shyster with a big cigar in a tall building, and I, I got disgusted by that thought. And I said to myself, it doesn't, I'm standing there walk, look, looking at the dirt, you know, the grave site. Right. Uh, and I said to myself, it doesn't matter, Robert. I'm literally talking first person to Robert. It doesn't matter. Everybody knows those are your songs. And I guess it was something to do with the heat of the day. The minute my mind formed that thought, and I believe I was actually speaking out loud at times, I realized that that was exactly my own predicament, you know. I mean, it was the the strangest thing. A light went on in my head, and I said, "John, that's just like you." So you got to start playing your songs because I had, you know, sworn off playing them for like twenty five years. Um, I said, "You got to start playing your song before you're lying here in the ground, <laughs> like Robert." I mean, it was just so clear. So anyway, so you know, I kind of made up my mind. Okay, yeah, I'll do that when the time comes. I, you know, I made a few more visits down there and I learned an awful lot about the the blues. You know, I had never even seen what the Delta looked like, so it, it really helped put it all in perspective. And then finally, um, you know, I went through a period of playing dobro and then uh, finally more guitar and that sort of thing, and it got my album Blue Moon Swamp recorded. This was now 90, 1997. And I started to do actually the very first... Uh, Press. It was actually the uh, the fella at Warner Brothers Records that was going to put together a, you know, the blurb about what I say about the record and all that. And I forget his last name, but his name is Davin. And uh, I'm talking to him about, it and I said, you know, I had this funny thing happen. I was at the grave with Robert Johnson, and uh, and, and then I looked at him and I said, oh my God. You know that was the reason I was called to go to Mississippi. It's like the, I, it took seven years for me to figure out. <laughs> you know, and life is really weird, but that that was such a mind blowing uh, confession. And fr- the, the the two thoughts finally joined in my head. I said, "That's what the whole thing was for." Oh my goodness, it was pretty exciting. <laughs> it was a revolution for yourself too. I love the way they connect like that, and the impact it had on your catalog. John, I know I got to let you go before I get chewed off the line. So if we get a chance to hook up when you're in town. I'd love to meet you, talk about your upcoming book. But I'm just grateful that you took the time to talk with us today, John. It really means a lot to me. You bet, Dave. Nice talking with you too. Thank you. You are quite welcome. Take care and be safe. God bless. All right. Bye bye. Bye.